Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast. The Persistence of Pertussis and the Prognostic Value of Bordetella Detection, presented by Dr. Carissa Colbreth, Medical Director, Infectious Disease, Tricor Reference Laboratories, and Associate Professor, Department of Pathology, University of New Mexico School of Medicine. I am Xavier Gutierrez of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by DSOR and Molecular. For more information about our sponsor, visit www.molecular.dsorin.com. Now, before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Colbreth. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Hello, um, I'm Carissa Colbreth, and I'm here today to speak with you about the persistence of pertussis um, and the prognostic value of Bordetella detection. Um, just a little bit about the laboratory um, where um, I work. Um, we are Tricor Reference Laboratories um, located in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We are um, a regional hospital laboratory, a regional reference laboratory, um, and we provide uh, laboratory services for three uh, major health systems in New Mexico. In addition to the hospitals that we serve, um, we also provide laboratory testing for a commercial physician and other smaller community hospital clients throughout the state. Um, as a frame of reference for our infectious disease laboratory, our volume is about 850,000 to 900,000 tests performed in the laboratory each year. And this ranges from the basic um, laboratory tests, um, such as cultures, to more esoteric molecular testing. All of the samples that are received in our laboratory are delivered by courier, um, and we have courier services going throughout the state and bringing specimens to the laboratory 24-7, and we are running tests in the laboratory 24-7. So here today we are speaking about Bordetella pertussis and other members of the Bordetella species group. Um, regarding Bordetella pertussis, humans are the only host for Bordetella pertussis, which is transmitted by uh, droplet transmission. Um, Bordetella um, contains several virulence factors. Of these, the most um, important causing disease is the pertussis toxin. However, there's other toxins um, and virulence factors that play a role in disease pathogenesis, including tracheal cytotoxin, which destroys the ciliated cells and inhibits cell regeneration, um, adenylate cyclase um, hemolysis, which induces apoptosis of cells, the filamentous, filamentous hemagglutinin promotes binding to various cell types and the fimbriae that helps to support colonization of the entire respiratory tract. These virulence factors taken together, together with pertussis toxin are what are able to mediate the uh, pathogenesis of the organism in the human host. There are multiple stages of pertussis infection um, that we are able to um, see in, um, in disease. Um, the first stage is the catarrhal stage. Um, this is the early um, stage that's occurring during this initial incubation period of seven to 10 days of incubation. At this point, what we would see clinically are nonspecific symptoms um, mimicking influenza-like illness. Um, these would consist of a low-grade fever, sore throat, nasal congest congestion, um, and other influenza-like 
illness symptoms. Um, these symptoms are generally mild, but there is a progressive dry cough that will later become more indicative and classic um, in the presentation of pertussis. The next stage that we would see is the paroxysmal stage. Um, and this stage is when we would see the classic whooping cough, um, which gives pertussis its um, most commonly known name of whooping cough. We also would see post-tested vomiting, um, a profuse production of mucus would occur at this stage. And then the paroxysms um, following coughing, um, they would occur at night and they increase in frequency um, throughout the next two to three weeks of infection. The last stage that we would see with um, pertussis is the convalescent stage. And at this stage, um, the disease severity begins to wane. The paroxysms decrease in frequency, duration, and severity, um, but there remains a mild cough. And this cough can last up to six weeks. During the course of the stages of infection, we see the organism burden um, be the highest during the catarrhal stage, and then it will decrease over over time um, through the convalescent stage. And during this time is when we're really seeing the, the activity um, of these virulence factors, in particular the pertussis toxin when it comes to pathogenesis. So a little bit more specifically about pertussis toxin. Um, this toxin is only expressed in Bordetella pertussis, um, and the toxin itself is an AB toxin. Um, the toxin is released from Bordetella pertussis in an inactive form, and then it binds the cell membrane receptor and is taken up into the endosome and it travels through the endoplasmic reticulum. The alpha subunit itself acts as the promoter, um, and then once it becomes activated, um, it prevents the activity of the G-protein coupled receptors um, and interferes with intracellular communication and increases um, cellular concentration of cyclic AMP, um, and it disrupts the cellular function through um, its ADP ribosylating activity. There are other Bordetella species that can cause disease um, other than Bordetella pertussis. These species include Bordetella parapertussis, bronchoseptica, and Holmesii. Um, all of these can pr produce disease, um, but they all um, have more mild presentations in general than Bordetella pertussis. Bordetella parapertussis um, lacks the production of the toxin um, due to a mutation in the promoter region. Um, it can cause a pertussis-like illness, but as I stated before, this illness is more mild in presentation in general than with Bordetella pertussis. There are two hosts for Bordetella parapertussis, um, humans and sheep. Bordetella bronchoseptica um, also lacks production of the um, Bordetella uh, pertussis toxin. Um, it can cause mild respiratory illness, but not necessarily pertussis-like illness. Um, and you may not see um, as long of a duration of coughing, um, won't see any of the paroxysms or the pertussis uh, post-tussis vo vomiting that you would see with Bordetella pertussis. Um, and then uh, there are also multiple hosts um, humans as well as other animal hosts. Bordetella homesii is an interesting and emerging pathogen um, that, we, that we are beginning to see as we're um, expanding our diagnostic capabilities for Bordetella uh, species. It cause a, causes a mild respiratory illness in immunocompetent hosts, um, but we'll speak a little bit further about the illnesses that it may be able to cause, um, and we're starting to see a bit more of an immunocompromised host. Um, and again, as with Bordetella pertussis, the only known hosts for Bordetella homesii um, are humans as hosts. So when we look at the clinical presentation, though, of Bordetella parapertussis um, compared to Bordetella pertussis, um, we can see that there are some significant differences, but there are some overlaps when it comes to the clinical presentation of these two pathogens. What we do see for Bordetella parapertussis is that there tends to be a shortened cough duration uh, compared to Bordetella pertussis. Bordetella parapertussis um, has an average of uh, 14 days, uh, the median of uh, coughs, uh, compared to 28-day uh, average um, cough duration for Bordetella parapertussis. Uh, 
Um, the presentation of the symptoms, though, of the pertussis-like symptoms actually tend to be fairly similar. Um, although we don't see as much of the uh, paroxysmal cough um, or the post-tussive vomiting, the whoop can be present in Bordetella paraprotestis. Uh, apnea is present with a less uh, common frequency. Um, however, there are some sleep disturbances, um, fewer hospitalizations, um, and then fewer deaths are also seen with paraprotestis. Um, and what we do see, though, is that many of the patients who would have uh, Bordetella paraprotestis um, are up to date with their um, vaccinations for pertussis, um, and that's because there's no protection, um, no crossing protection between Bordetella pertussis and paraprotussis when it comes to vaccination for Bordetella pertussis. When it comes to the presentation for Bordetella home CI, um, what we do see is that in immunocompetent patients, um, there's mostly just a, a mild upper respiratory illness, um, but we're seeing some emerging uh, challenges and infections in immunocompromised hosts. Um, in the immunocompromised hosts in infants, we're seeing um, pertussis-like illness. However, it's a more mild presentation with fewer of the classic pertussis symptoms that are seen. Um, there's shorter cough duration. Um, and overall, there's a more mild respiratory illness when it comes to the respiratory presentation of infection. However, what we are seeing is that there is uh, more commonly occurring with Bordetella home CI than we see with Bordetella pertussis, a systemic infection. Um, and these infections in immunocompromised hosts, um, we see as bacteremia, cellulitis, and pneumonia. And this we very rarely, if ever, would see it, uh, with Bordetella uh, pertussis um, in immunocompetent or um, infant hosts. Um, so we're seeing Bordetella home CI as certainly an emerging um, and interesting infection uh, that may warrant some additional attention um, in the future as we're seeing increased numbers of immunocompromised patients, of course, in our population. However, bringing it back to Bordetella pertussis, we are seeing in the community that there is a resurgence of Bordetella pertussis um, following major vaccination strategies over the past 50 years. Um, and there's two major factors that um, are the cause of this resurgence of Bordetella pertussis. Uh, one of the factors is waning immunity. Um, and so we've Initially, with the Tdap acellular vaccine um, that had the pertussis toxin um, and various uh, pertussis uh, factors that were included in the vaccine. The immunity um, is expected to last initially about 30 years, but what research is now showing when we look at the um, serial status of individuals is that the immunity is really lasting more in the range of 40 to 20 years um, with demonstrated vaccine effectiveness um, in the younger age groups of eight to 12 year olds, 20 to 40%. So there's limited uh, vaccine effectiveness and in combination with a shortened um, immu uh, immunity, immunity period, uh, we're seeing that we have this issue of waning immunity. Uh, what also has been shown in animal models is that the initial acellular vaccine did not um, have a reduction in the nasal carriage of the organism. So there may have been additional transmission opportunities um, while an individual may not uh, get the disease themselves without the reduction in the nasal carriage of the organism, you would potentially still be able to transmit the infection to other um, naive hosts. And so these factors together um, have impacted the immunity that's been uh, achieved with the vaccine. Um, however, in addition to those kind of factors uh, addressed with immunity, what we've also seen is that there are molecular adaptations in the organism itself that are impacting the ability of pertussis to resurge in the population. So we're seeing molecular adaptations um, in the pertussis toxin, in protactin, and in the fimbriae that have been targets for the vaccine. Um, and so that 
may allow those uh, allelic variations to emerge in population. There's also been emergence of protactin deficient strains, um, and this emergence began around 1994 worldwide. In fact, in 2012, the CDC um, surveyed the isolates that it had um, in its database um, and found that over 50% of the isolates tested by the CDC were in fact protactin deficient. Um, and this appears to be at least associated somewhat with this resurgence of Bordetella pertussis. But in combination with these things, we're also finding, um, and I think it's important to recognize, that around this time of recognition, recognition of waning immunity and emergence of molecular adaptations, we also have improved diagnostic methods, which is also helping us to de detect more cases of pertussis. Um, and perhaps this is also playing a factor in the resurgence of pertussis in the communities. So when we think about the diagnostic methods that we've had available to us over time, um, we find that there have been some challenges with uh, diagno diagnosis of pertussis. Um, culture for um, Bordetella pertussis um, is only about 60% sensitive, um, and the highest recovery rate for culture um, is with infants when the specimens are collected within the first two weeks of the cough. The challenge with this is that within those first two weeks of the cough, they can, this can still be within this initial catarrhal phase where one may not have pertussis high on the differential because you haven't had that extended cough period, um, and it may just uh, be perceived as an influenza-like illness. However, having cultures for Bordetella pertussis is important because it is useful to detect these mutations um, that can uh, help us to understand how the vaccine is impacting um, the, the organism and allelic variants that may be emerging. And we can also use these isolates to detect emerging antimicrobial resistance. Um, the CDC, um, in fact, has initiated some initiatives to recover more Bordetella pertussis isolates to combat these various factors. Um, also, there's specific media that are required for the detection of um, and, and recovery of Bordetella uh, pertussis in the laboratory, and most laboratories don't routinely keep uh, these media um, in stock. Um, in the laboratory, the organism is quite fastidious um, and can take um, many days, a week or more, um, for recovery on these specific media. So culture is just not a routine method that is done in the laboratory, though there are certainly some benefits for having culture available. Okay, so as we examine um, the options for diagnostic and the optimal timing for diagnostic testing um, for pertussis, we see that from the time of cough onset, um, culture um, is the um, is optimal only in those first two weeks. Um, after that, um, and that's when pertussis really becomes more on the differential for. Um, for clinicians, um, once patients have passed that initial catarrhal phase, where uh, the patient would have influenza-like illness um, and perhaps a more mild cough, after that second week is when the patient would begin to enter into some of the more classic pertussis symptoms. And that is when other methods become more available and are optimal for the diagnosis of pertussis, including uh, utilization of PCR and molecular testing, as well as serological testing. Um, so we'll look first at the um, use of serologic testing for pertussis. Um, while it's not often used because it can be challenging and that it can require acute and convalescent specimens, um, the detection of the specific anti-pertussis toxin antibodies um, can be helpful and can be used as a sensitive way to establish infections. Um, when, when a significant duration of time has passed, um, um, and relatively late in disease. Um, but there are many factors that do impact the accuracy and the sensitivity of serodiagnosis of pertussis. Um, this can include the time elapsed since the last vaccination um, or if there was a previous infection um, and whether or not 
only the primary series of um, uh, a vaccination has occurred or va uh, booster vaccinations were given. Um, in addition, the overall antigen content of the vaccine um, and the age of the patient are all factors that have to be weighed in uh, when determining uh, the, the uh, clinical significance of the positive result. Um, and so this is really a challenge when it comes to utilization of serologic testing and interpreting the result. Serology can't be used during the year following vaccination. Um, and with all of these factors, there's really some challenges and in some cases limited diagnostic value um, for deciding uh, treatment or prophylactic decisions uh, for Bordetella pertussis. So this brings us to the utilization of molecular testing um, and molecular diagnostics for pertussis. Um, when we're looking at this method, overall, we utilized um, insertion sequence elements as the primary target for Bordetella um, NAT assays. Um, we utilize at least three of these uh, insertion sequences to try to help us to differentiate between multiple species of pertussis uh, or Bordetella, and then other factors can be used um, for further speciation. So looking first at the insertion sequence 481, um, it is present in Bordetella pertussis at anywhere from 50 to 200 copies. So this makes it a wonderful target for the detection of Bordetella pertussis because it's present in so many copies, uh, we can get to a higher sensitivity in detection of Bordetella pertussis in clinical specimens. However, there is a challenge in that it can be present in Bordetella Holmesii at a lower copy number of 10 to 50 copies. Um, so this does uh, bring up some challenges uh, because any specimen that is positive for insertion sequence 481 could also potentially uh, be um, not just Bordetella pertussis, it could actually also be Bordetella Holmesii. Additionally, um, fewer, uh, very few, only 3%, um, but certainly um, it's present um, in 3% of Bordetella bronchoseptica cluster 1 strains. Um, but the insertion sequence 481 um, provides us with a good potential for use for the detection of Bordetella pertussis. Um, then we have the insertion sequence 1001, uh, which is present in Bordetella paraprotussis um, at a copy number of 22. But it is also present in 29% of Bordetella bronchoseptica cluster 1 strains. Um, and a variant of this insertion sequence can also be detected in uh, Bordetella homesii at about three to five copies. The insertion sequence 1002 uh, is present in Bordetella pertussis at a very low copy number, less than 10 copies, um, also seen at less than 10 copies for Bordetella paraprotussis, and only in one copy for Bordetella bronchoseptica. So this is traditionally not used as um, a detection method for um, Bordetella species. Additionally, um, to help to increase the specificity for Bordetella pertussis, um, the pertussis toxin, uh, which is only present in Bordetella pertussis, uh, can be used to improve the specificity for molecular targets. However, it is only present in one copy, so we run into some sensitivity challenges. And then REC-A um, can be used to help to differentiate those uh, uh, the detection of Bordetella homesii um, as it is present in only one copy um, for Bordetella homesii and only present in Bordetella homesii. So we see these multi-copy genes, um, and they're certainly helpful um, to support diagnostic sensitivity, um, which is needed when it comes to the detection of Bordetella pertussis. Um, and this use of multi-copy genes is helpful because we can then detect at sensitivities less than or at one uh, CFU. Um, however, this does present a challenge because it could even detect uh, colonization or carrier states. <clears throat> 
Um, using the insertion sequ sequence 141, though, uh, we do run into uh, specificity risk because uh, this insertion sequence is present in both Bordetella pertussis and in Bordetella holmesii. So how do we mitigate this uh, specificity risk of the insertion sequence? One of the things that could be done um, is through review of additional sequences, such as um, the insertion sequence 1001, um, or um, to, to differentiate between Bordetella uh, pertussis, Holmes CI, and paraprotestis, um, but to differentiate between the presence of Bordetella pertussis and Bordetella Holmes CI, one could do periodic surveillance of Bordetella Holmes CI in your population um, to determine whether or not um, Bordetella Holmes CI is ever circulating in the population, or you could add a second target for increased sensitivity, such as the addition of the uh, pertussis toxin or REC-A to differentiate between Bordetella pertussis and Bordetella holmesii. Um, so this could be, you know, a potential model to look at. Um, how would one uh, determine um, whether or not you have Bordetella pertussis or Bordetella homesii circulating within the population by the addition of Bordetella pertussis uh, toxin detection and REC-A to increase the specificity for Bordetella pertussis and Bordetella homesii. However, we do risk at this point with the one copy gene uh, sensitivity at low organism burdens that we often see in diagnostic specimens. So an additional method that one could use instead of the addition of the pertussis toxin or REC-A would be the addition of the insertion sequence 1002 um, to increase the specificity for differentiation of Bordetella pertussis and Bordetella homesii um, because it is present in a higher copy number than pertussis toxin um, and REC-A. However, both of these present still the challenge of uh, sensitivity um, and the, the potential loss of sensitivity while increasing specificity. So overall, um, it still, I think, becomes the best method to focus on the insertion sequence 1481 um, for detection of Bordetella pertussis, recognizing that there may be some carryover cross-reactivity to Bordetella homesii and doing periodic surveillance in the population to determine whether or not Bordetella homesii um, is present in uh, the community. In our laboratory, we use um, a laboratory-developed test um, identifying the um, a primer pair that targets the insertion sequence 41, um, which would detect Bordetella pertussis, um, as well as some potential um, carryover cross-reactivity to Bordetella homesii. We also have um, this multiplexed with the detection of Bordetella paraprotussis using the insertion sequence um, 1001. This um, also includes an internal control primer pair um, that is used to monitor PCR amplification and or inhibition. And the assay is performed on the liaison MDX instrument. We have, have evaluated in our laboratory two methods for detection of uh, pertussis and paraprotussis in specimens in the laboratory. Um, we use one method and evaluated one method, which is an extraction method, um, where we extract 200 microliters of um, uh, VTM from a nasal pharyngeal specimen or nasal wash that is received in the laboratory. And then we utilize five microliters of the extracted nucleic acid in the master mix for detection of the specimen. We then were able to compare this method to a direct detection method where we take the nasal pharyngeal swab that's in VTM and we utilize three microliters of that direct specimen um, of the VTM and add that to the master mix. In both of these cases, the samples were tested with the Diasoran, uh, Diasoran molecular primer pairs on the liaison MDX instrument um, using the 96 well universal disks. It's important to note that these assays are laboratory developed tests, um, and this was used with um, ASR reagents, um, and it's not cleared by the FDA.
When we evaluated the performance of the direct versus the extracted method, we used 147 previously characterized specimens, um, and they were detected. Uh, they were tested by both methods. We evaluated for the presence of pertussis and paraprotussis among these specimens, um, and we find that there was a positive agreement of 92.9 percent and a negative agreement of 100 percent. Focusing on the seven specimens that were positive by the extracted method, but weren't detected by the direct method, um, we evaluated these uh, discrepant results. Um, and we looked at these results based on the CT range um, of the specimens. Um, so what we can see is that when specimens were in the CT range of having a cycle threshold between 10 and 20, uh, there was 100% agreement. And we see that same 100% agreement when we have a cycle threshold of 21 to 30. However, at the later cycle thresholds of greater than 31 is where we began to see the emergence of the discrepant samples. Um, at 31 to 35, however, there were agreement with 20 of the specimens and only four discrepant samples. At 35 plus, we had uh, four samples that are agreed and there were four samples that were discrepant. And then when we look at the type of samples among these discrepants, we see that we had um, for Bordetella pertussis and paraprotussis um, at the 31 to 35, um, there were 30, uh, sorry, uh, two Bordetella pertussis samples that didn't agree and one Bordetella paraprotussis sample um, that didn't agree. The, the fourth sample among those 31 to 35 was an indeterminate sample that we weren't able to do further discrepant analysis on. Um, for the 35 plus, um, cycle threshold value, we found three Bordetella pertussis samples that were discrepant and one Bordetella paraprotussis sample that was discrepant. You can see for all of these that these have very fairly late uh, CT values um, in, the, um, in the specimens. So when we evaluate the analytic detection of um, pertussis, um, we determine the sensitivity of this, these two real-time PCR assays um, by measuring tenfold serial dilutions of purified pertussis um, and paraprotussis nucleic acid. We evaluated these at 10 to the 0 and 10 to the 7 genomic equivalents per reaction. Um, and then we determined the average CT value based on the five replicates that were evaluated at each of the concentrations for each of the um, uh, target performance. Um, and what we're able to determine is that for the um, extracted method, we have earlier CT values um, compared to the direct method. They um, are slightly later. And then we, um, as we um, go down into um, increasingly dilute specimens, um, we find that by um, the time that we get to 10 to the zero genomic equivalents, um, we're no longer able to um, accurately detect Bordetella paraprotussis um, in the specimen for the direct extraction. We are able to um, still direct, um, detect Bordetella paraprotussis, but at a fairly late CT value. And so this does correspond with the data that we saw um, with our discrepant results um, that we start to get later um, crossing thresholds um, and potentially begin to miss um, the detection of uh, Bordetella pertussis and paraprotussis once we get into the um, uh, lower concentrations of organisms present in the sample um, as determined by this sensitivity study. So then when we compare the CT values um, for Bordetella pertussis and paraprotussis um, for linearity in the extracted versus the non-extracted or direct specimens, um, we see that when we um, view our y-intercept, we do have a um, bias towards um, a, a later CT value for the non-extracted specimens. Um, however, there is still um, a fairly good correlation of these CT values um, at uh, 0.95 for the, um, for the, um, the R squared and the slope is at one. Um, but there is somewhat of a bias towards um, a later CT value um, as we can see for the Y-intercept. 
So what would be some of these causes as we look um, at the direct versus extracted um, values um, for uh, pertussis? What would cause um, a late CT and, and in basically a lower organism burden in the specimen. Um, the timing from the specimen collection post specimen symptom development um, would result in fewer organisms present and a lower organism burden, Add would, as would the timing from specimen collection following antibiotic treatment. Um, it's been demonstrated that patients with older age have a lower organism burden. Um, and if there's environmental contamination with pertussis, um, that would also, um, potential contamination sources, um, though they would be a false positive, they're usually present at a lower organism burden. So all of these would have an impact on the CT value. Um, and uh, for uh, the specimens and, and overall the organism burden that we would see in these specimens. So I'm gonna shift gears just a little bit because we really need to kind of focus on what are we looking for when we're looking to detect pertussis in the clinical specimen. We can evaluate the analytical sensitivity um, of the test, um, but it's also important to understand clinically what are the specimens that we are receiving in the laboratory um, because all of the factors factors that I've mentioned previously um, would all be influenced by these pre-analytical forces that would impact the specimen that we received in the lab. Um, so just a bit about New Mexico pertussis epidemiology. Um, New Mexico has experienced pertussis uh, uh, rates um, of epidemic proportions in, of pertussis since 2011. Um, in 2012, New Mexico actually experienced a threefold increase in cases compared to 2011. Um, and the US, um, even during that time, also experienced the highest incidence of pertussis since uh, 1959. Um, but historically, New Mexico itself has had higher pertussis rates than have been seen um, overall in the United States. Um, when it comes to the overall vaccination recommendations, um, infants and children um, are expected to receive five doses of Tdap um, at two, four, six, and then 15 to 18 months, and then once at a point um, between four to six years of age. Adolescents then receive a single dose of Tdap um, at 11 to 12 years of age, and then uh, pregnant women are expected to receive a single dose of Tdap during every pregnancy at 12 to 36 weeks of gestation. So when we look more specifically at the New Mexico pertussis epidemiology and think about these vaccination recommendations, we see that the highest age group um, um, that most commonly has Bordetella pertussis, especially during these um, outbreak years of 2011 to about 2013, um, were children um, ages uh, less than one. So children in the infant age range um, were certainly an outlier. Uh, patients ages uh, at greater than 20 um, remained fairly low during this time period, but there is a slight bump during that outbreak um, set of years. And then um, the patients in the remainder of the age ranges um, appear to just cluster together um, in the rates of pertussis per 100,000 population. So when we look more specifically at the sources of infant transmission, um, we see that mothers um, in, at the age of zero to one month of age are the most common cause of um, pertussis transmission, um, which is the cause and the need for mothers to get a vaccination um, during every pregnancy. Um, however, it's important to note that siblings um, are the most common source of infant transmission um, for any age, um, from the zero to one month of age or the two to 11 month of age. Um, so it is certainly important to recognize siblings um, as a source of pertussis transmission um, for the infants in the population.
So when we consider our pertussis cases and our uh, immunization rates in New Mexico, um, what we see is that there really isn't a strong correlation between the numbers of pertussis cases and whether or not individuals are uh, immunized for pertussis. Uh, we can see that the areas with the highest uh, pertussis cases um, um, in the slide in the image on the left are in the darker shading. And the places with the highest rates of vaccination um, on the right side are in uh, the darkish, or, sorry, are in the lighter sh um, shading. So the places where uh, people are uh, most fully in immunized on the right side are the lighter shading. Um, so we can see that there's really not a huge correlation um, that the, the places that have the highest cases of pertussis are not necessarily the places that have the lowest rates of immunization. Um, um, so this shows us that we're in some ways fighting this uphill battle um, of effects of immunity and waning immunity, immunity and perhaps emergence of other uh, strains of uh, pertussis, um, as well as trying to control the number of cases. But this is also why surveillance for pertussis is extremely important. So when it comes to Department of Health needs, um, we in New Mexico utilize an enhanced per, uh, pertussis surveillance because of the um, uh, uh, epidemic that we have been in over the past several years. And so we see the clinical case definition for pertussis um, that in the absence of a more likely diagnosis, a cough illness lasting greater than or equal to two weeks with one of the uh, pertussis symptoms um, being the clinical case definition. And then a confirmed case um, is an acute cough, cough with the isolation of Bordetella pertussis from a clinical specimen um, or a PCR positive positive or a contact with a case that um, has had contact with a laboratory confirmed case of pertussis. And so what we did in our laboratory was we entered into a partnership um, and collaboration with the New Mexico Department of Health, um, enhanced pertussis surveillance. Um, we evaluated specimens with the Department of Health from 2013 to 2015. Um, we evalu evaluated 418 pertussis positive patients by PCR that also had a concurrent Department of Health investigation. Results from this investigation were aligned with PCR CT values, um, and we correlated these results with the results of the Department of Health investigation. There were some limitations to this study. Um, one, pertussis negative specimens and patients were not included in the study, um, and we did not have enough Bordetella paraprotesis positive patients that also had an investigation um, for significance, and so they were not included in the study and in the evaluation. So we look at the demographics of the patients who were included in this study to look at kind of the clinical factors that come into play um, with pertussis diagnosis. We see that there was a fairly even distribution between age, uh, male and female. Um, the age tended to be the mean age was uh, 14 years of age. Um, when we look at the, um, the clinical data, we find that patients had an average of 23 days of cough duration um, with a variety of presentation for the other pertussis, like the, the pertussis symptoms that would fall within the case definition. Um, the most commonly occurring uh, symptoms is the paroxysmal cough, um, but also present was post tussive vomiting, whoop, apnea, cyanosis. We did not have any cases of acute encephalopathy or um, any deaths, but there were um, 35 or um, around 8% of the patients were hospitalized. There was only one case of a, gen of, sorry, four cases um, of a patient with generalized focal seizure. Um, interestingly, in only 72% of the cases were antibiotics given, and then 61% of the cases had ever received a vaccine. 11% um, of the cases were outbreak associated. When we look at the demographic profile of the patients um, to determine um, the percent of the population that met the uh, criteria of a case 
um, uh, clinical case definition for pertussis, we find that um, across the age range, um, around 80% um, or a bit over 80% of the population met the clinical uh, criteria of the presence of the paroxysms of coughing um, or the other factors for um, pertussis case definition. Now, when we look at the CT value of the percent of the patients who met um, the pertussis uh, diagnostic criteria, uh, we find that the highest percentage of patients who meet the pertussis uh, criteria um, had less than 30 um, CT value, so had um, a higher organism burden. So in the, the patients who had this higher um, organism burden, 90% uh, of the, those patients met the clinical criteria excluding the diagnosis of pertussis from that criteria and only looking at the clinical factors, 90% of the patients with a CT value of less than 30 um, uh, met these uh, uh, case definition. Uh, when you had the population of patients between 30 and 40, approximately 85% of those patients had the clinical uh, symptoms associated with pertussis. And then of the patients who had greater than 40 CT value, this was a much lower number, but 70% of those patients um, had uh, the clinical factors that would be associated with pertussis. Now, one of the things that we were able to do with our population is look at the impact of the symptoms and the demographic factors on the CT value. So what we did was we developed a reference patient that had kind of basic demographics. So we said this patient would be kind of our, our model patient um, that we would then compare every other demographic value against this patient. Um, a, a gender had no impact on um, the, the CT value as we saw earlier. So we just arbitrarily selected the patient to be female. We selected this kind of reference patient to be an adult, 18 to 64 years old, uh, that they were hypothetically tested the day after, immediately after symptoms started, that they had never received antibiotics, and that we selected a, a fairly median CT value of 30. And so when we look at then the relative contribution of each of the demographic factors um, and then a couple of the more significant clinical symptoms, what we see is that, again, uh, gender had no impact on the CT value, whether or not it would increase or decrease above or below 30. But what we do see is that um, in patients who are less than one year old, that significantly drops the CT value um, by 6%. 0.54 points. Um, the other ages, with the exception of greater than 64 years of old of age, um, which also dropped the CT value by about 30. Uh, three points, sorry, about three points, the remainder of the ages really did not have an impact on the overall CT value. When we look at the clinical presentation um, and the cough onset to uh, to testing per day, what we see is an increase in the CT value um, as we add each day of cough before testing occurs. So, for instance, um, if testing was occurred the day after um, the cough occurred, um, there would be no impact. And then on day two, there would be an increase of 0.12 on the, on the CT value and a factor of 0.12 increase on each subsequent day of testing. Um, and so this shows that the CT value increases as the cough duration continues. Um, if patients received antibiotics prior to testing, that would add um, about two and a half to our CT value. Um, and so we can look at these factors and determine um, how uh, the clinical factors associated with the disease and the demographic factors for the patient would pl play a role on whether or not we would be able to detect pertussis um, in a clinical specimen.
Um, again, if we look at this data by age, we can look at the relative response to CT value and the symptoms by age. Um, and what we find, um, it, again, is that in the patients that are less than one, adding any of these clinical symptoms uh, would increase, or sorry, decrease the CT value um, because there would be an overall higher burden. Um, but in the older patients, we see um, that the CT value tends to go up a bit more um, because uh, uh, likely the patients are able to control a little bit better the infection um, uh, that they may be seeing um, in the patient and in the clinical specimen. We may have left less of the specimen, uh, less of the organism present in the specimen. So finally, in conclusion, what we see is that the changing epidemi epidemiology of Bordetella pertussis really highlights the need for effective and rapid molecular diagnostic testing. We certainly in New Mexico have seen an outbreak of um, Bordetella pertussis, uh, multiple outbreaks in multiple settings, um, and we continue to have relative high uh, pertussis rates uh, here in New Mexico. So molecular testing that provides sensitive and rapid molecular diagnostic diagnostics is certainly important. Um, in our laboratory, we've used the uh, Diosorin molecular uh, Bordetella pertussis and paraprotussis reagents, um, and these can be used to detect Bordetella pertussis and paraprotussis with or without extraction. Um, we find that lower CT values are positively correlated uh, with a patient's likelihood of meeting pertussis case definitions and symptom presentations. Um, and then finally, demographic and clinical profiles um, seem to have predictable effects on the CT value. And this can help us to understand a bit more um, about how sensitivity of certain tests um, and even the results in the lab um, can translate into a clinical response. So thank you very much for your time, um, and I'm happy to take any questions um, from the um, viewers of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Colbreth, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar, and we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click on the Send button. Our speaker will follow up with your questions via email. Okay, let's get started. Our first question is, are there Bordetella pertussis carriers who do not have symptoms but can spread to unvaccinated Definitely. Um, I think as I um, was able to show in uh, one of the slides earlier, uh, the transmission um, to uh, infants, many of those individuals, uh, siblings, um, parents, grandparents, others, um, can certainly be asymptomatic or they may just have um, um, some of them a more mild presentation of disease because they may be um, uh, partially vaccinated um, and so they can be carriers and so certainly they can transmit um, Bordetella pertussis to un unvaccinated individuals um, and the most at risk for um, severe disease um, and in the unvaccinated population is most certainly infants. Um, so it is certainly important for uh, vaccination um, to occur in people who would potentially have contact with um, unvaccinated um, individuals, especially infants. Okay. And how do you tell the difference between an active infection or a carrier when the CT value of the assay are when the CT values of the assay are high, above a CT of 30? And do you have a cutoff that is informed by studies correlated with clinical symptoms? Um, so I think the, the question being, um, do we have a, a cutoff value that would distinguish between um, a carrier state or active disease? And, you know, that's really the challenge is that um, a later CT value doesn't necessarily mean that a patient doesn't have active disease. It could still just be late in infection. Um, we're talking about weeks of um, cough uh, 
when it comes to the catarrhal phase and then even the convalescent stage. Um, and then by the time an individual presents with pertussis, um, they're usually presenting um, several weeks after uh, the cough has initiated. I believe our data showed uh, the cough, average cough duration at the time of testing was 14 days. So that's two weeks after the initial um, initial presentation of the cough. Um, so there's this challenge with pertussis diagnosis. Uh, do you have a cutoff um, where you uh, decide that you're going to um, either no longer report or uh, report some type of equivocal range where you say patient may not have active disease? Um, I think that's that's a challenge. I think really it's, it's important to understand the factors that impact a later CT value um, and to work in collaboration with clinicians and public health to help them understand um, that a patient who has been coughing for a long duration or a patient who may have been treated at some point would um, certainly uh, have a, a positive result, but it may be later. Um, I think it's important to help clinicians understand the mechanisms behind the testing, but we in our laboratory do not have a cutoff um, after 30 or after uh, uh, 35. If we have a positive result in our test, a uh, resulted as positive, but, and we do not utilize a cutoff um, because I think there's just some clinical challenges um, that make having a cutoff value um, even more difficult to interpret. And how often are you monitor monitoring for the presence of Bordetella homesia in your population? And what is the prevalence rate? Yeah, so great. Thank you um, for bringing that up. I meant to mention that in the presentation. Um, among the specimens that we tested um, for the comparison between the direct and the extracted method, we also checked for Bordetella homesii. We actually didn't find any in our population. Um, so of, of just that, uh, about 147, I believe, specimens. Um, so we routinely, um, we've done a couple of times over the past uh, two years, um, is just done a couple of point prevalence studies where we'll take about 50 previously positive Bordetella pertussis specimens um, and run them to determine whether or not we have any Bordetella homesii. We haven't seen any um, in our population, um, but again, it's not a full surveillance study, um, but that's, a, I think, a great opportunity for continued collaborations with uh, laboratories and their local departments of health uh, to, to determine uh, whether or not they have Bordetella homesii circulating in populations um, and how the lab could help to support diagnosis uh, and differentiation of Bordetella pertussis and Bordetella homesii. All right, and we have time for one more question. Uh, in the last few months, what is the recent prevalence rate of Bordetella pertussis in New Mexico? Um, so uh, we unfortunately are still seeing fairly highly high rates of um, Bordetella pertussis, um, though they're starting to... Um, to go back down. Um, right now, I believe the, the last data that we were seeing um, was um, around the five, um, five uh, cases per 100,000. Um, and so we're hoping that we can continue to see some decreases in those rates in our population. All right, well, I would like to once again, thank Dr. Colbreth for her presentation. I would also like to thank Dia Soren for making today's educational webcast possible. And before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December of 2018. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Be sure that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you again soon.